first and foremost, I guess I want to welcome everyone to the first part of this three-part series titled Seek Me and Live, Hasidism and the Spiritual Journey. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce and welcome back to Drisha, Rabbi Dr. Ariel Evan Mays. A little bit about our speaker today, Rabbi Mays is an assistant professor of religious studies at Stanford University in the Department of Religious Studies and serves as the rabbi in residence at Atik, the Jewish Maker Institute. But prior to this, he was the director of Jewish studies and a visiting assistant professor of modern Jewish thought at Hebrew Union College in Newton, Massachusetts. Rabbi Mays received his PhD in Jewish studies from Harvard University, and he received his rabbinic ordination from Beit Midrash Harel in Israel. He's the author of Speaking Infinites, God and Language in the Teaching of the Magid of Mizrich, just published by University of Pennsylvania Press in 2020. Congratulations. And he was the co-editor of the two-volume book, a New Hasidism, Roots and Branches, published by JPS in 2019. So Rabbi Mays is currently working on a forthcoming monograph examining the relationship between spirituality and law from the dawn of Hasidism to the eve of the 20th century. And on behalf of all of us at Jerisha, it's a real pleasure to have Rabbi Mays teaching with us again. I believe the last time may have been in 2016, uh, maybe 2017, uh, but that's either right. way, oh, great. Well, we feel lucky to have you back. So without further ado, Rabbi Mays. Thank you so much for this warm introduction, and it's really wonderful to be here together. In Elul, every year I come back to this theme of spiritual journeys, of the journeys that we take in this world. Some of that, I think, has to do with my path within Judaism, which came very much from within my journey as a, as a martial artist. And I spent many years um, studying traditional Shotokan karate. And the ultimate moment, you might say, in the journey of martial arts is attaining a black belt, which many people think of as a kind of uh, recognition of mastery. Um, but within the world of martial arts, when you attain a black belt, you move from what's called Q, or being a beginner, to Shodan, to being a student. And the ultimate move is really just the acknowledgement that you've learned how to be a student. And I think about this every year during Elul, as I think about the infinite quest and the fact that the journeys that unfold within our religious life have no ends, quests have no end. Questions have answers, but quests do not. Every year we go through Elul. Every year we go through Rosh Hashanah. Every year we go through Yom Kippur. We are not the same people, and the rituals are different because of that. But the journeys unfold across time in these sort of unique ways. So by journeys, I, I mean a lot of things. I mean, there's the physical peregrinations, the ways in which we wander across the face of the earth, but I think of these in, in inner states. For example, tefillah, prayer, it's a journey. Every time I open the siddur, it's a journey to go from the very beginning, which feels like so much, to go all the way to the end of the prayer service, whether it's for five minutes or whether it's for an hour or more, it's a journey to move from the beginning of tefillah to the end of tefillah. But it's also a journey that we undertake on a daily basis. And we have new challenges and new excitements in every time we open the siddur or from when we pray from amidst our own heart. Um, learning. The more Talmud you learn, the more you don't know, know anything. And it's true of Hasidut, it's true of Gemara, it's true of philosophy, it's true of anything worth studying. One of my teachers, um, who I don't know, never got to know personally, but was someone with whom I studied, with whose students I studied, um, Rabbi Isidore Tversky, the Talna Rebbe and the uh, teacher of Jewish studies at Harvard, used to tell his students that any dissertation that exhausts a subject, that subject wasn't worth writing about in the first place. And it's true of books. Anything that is worth our time to study is going to be so expansive that we're never going to understand it in all of its fullness. That's true of any intellectual quest. The Midot, our inner um, moral 
and emotional character traits. These are things that we work on constantly over a long period of time. And it's not something that we perfect, but it's something that we continue to refine. Theology. I don't think I've met anyone who thinks about God who thinks, yeah, like I've got it all worked out. I basically know where all the ducks go and it all fits together. Theology should be a verb rather than a noun. It's a noun, it's a process. It's something that we do. And the mitzvot, maybe I'm different in this way, but I don't think so. I don't think I've ever done a mitzvah, whether it's sitting in the sukkah or keeping Shabbat or anything that I've tried to do and felt like, yeah, that was really it. I hit all, all the buttons. I checked all the boxes. I think I did it right. Doesn't mean that I don't do things right, but it means that there are ever more vistas of understanding ever deeper things to look for, ever higher levels of attainment. And rather than becoming a kind of paralysis, that allows us to stride forward on these journeys, knowing that the deeper we go or the higher we go, the more we'll see and the more we'll know that we have even farther to go. Now these journeys, that I think about during Elul are to a certain extent individual. Nobody can take my journey. I'm here to do that. And I'm the only one who can do that. But they're also with other people. These journeys that we take are with our teachers, with our fellow travelers, with our students. We take these journeys and we undertake these journeys from within the world of human community. The friendships, the chavrutas, the relationships sustain us on our journey. And getting to know other people is also a kind of infinite journey. It's a journey into the infinite richness of another person's inner world. And in that way, we are all each other's teachers. So the journeys that we're going to talk about today and next week and the week after are those that are infinite. They're non-linear as well. You step forward, you move forward, then you step back and you move in a different direction. And that requires flexibility, resilience, and perseverance. The Baal Shem Tov, who we'll talk about a little bit this week and more next week, gave a beautiful and famous parable for this, um, that when we are ascending toward God, toward something, it's like ascending on a spiral staircase. Um, half the time when you're ascending a spiral staircase, you can see the end goal. And the other half of the time, you're trapped underneath the platform and you have no idea where you're going and you're walking forward in a kind of shade. And it feels at that moment, it's like you're not going anywhere. Like you're not making any progress. Like I'm not moving. And so the Baal Shem Tov takes pain to underscore that when you are moving forward, only sometimes will it actually feel like you have that kind of forward motion sometimes it will feel like you're just standing in place, but that too is a part of the work and you have to trust that one foot in front of the other will lead you somewhere. We, this summer, my family and I went camping with the bears and the volcanoes in Lassen National Park in Northern California. And um, we forced our three-year-old together with our other kids to march up in a, a dormant volcano and it's 890 vertical feet or something like that. And he walked up with one of our good friends and this friend kept telling our three-year-old, one foot in front of the other, one step after the other. And 900 vertical feet and an hour later, he got to the top. And now that's one of the lessons that he teaches people. He tells people, one foot in front of the other, step by step. 
So the journeys are infinite, they're nonlinear, and they're hard. There are also a lot of stations along the way, places that we have to hold space for a brief moment as we continue the forward journey. Now, in a certain sense, those can be tempting because we get comfortable in them. I feel good, I feel like I've accomplished something, I feel like I am where I need to be. And those are the moments where you need to keep moving forward. But it's those stations, those moments of attainment that give us both the impetus or the sort of thrust to move forward, but at the same time, they also give us a moment of respite and restoration. And you hold both of those things together, the acknowledgement of moving forward and the understanding that those moments of standing still, either together or alone, of really um, appreciating what you have understood or what you have accomplished are part and parcel of creating this kind of braided path forward. So the texts that we will be looking at are essentially those that describe a commitment to process, a dedication to the quest, rather than a fixation upon a particular goal. Which is to say, the commitment to religious growth, to relationship with God, to relationships with other people, not as goal-oriented, but as quest-oriented, of listening to the call of every moment, being present in that, and not simply fixated or transfixed by something that we imagine as our ultimate goal, and yet always striving forward and never allowing ourselves to become complacent where we are. Um, that's all I wanted to say by way of an introduction. Quests and questions are very different. Questions have answers, quests unfold. And so across the next three weeks, we'll undertake a quest moving from the Hebrew Bible to the 13th century and into the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries, looking at a series of different texts that show us, at times, very different understandings of the way in which we can help us, that we can help ourselves undertake these quests. Um, do we have the capacity for question and answer? I don't, I don't know, is this we do. We do have okay. Q&A. If um, people seem to have been a little bit more comfortable just simply putting their questions in the chat. And so mm -hmm. if, uh, if somebody wants to do that, if you would like to use the q and I'll keep an eye out for it. If for any reason you don't see it, then I will, I'll bring it to your attention as well. And on Great. Facebook, we happily post, you know, if anybody has any questions, please post them here and then I will share those with you as well. Great. One of the things that I find most frustrating about Zoom education is the way in which it allows for a certain kind of receptivity um, or passivity. So I, if you have any questions or if you have any thoughts, please engage, please reach out, reach through the screen, break the wall. I don't know if it's the fourth wall or the fifth wall or whatever it needs to be. Um, but I often really enjoy teaching in an interactive format, and I am more, more, more than delighted to continue that. So I note that there's one comment in the chat bar here about doing theology as opposed to um, um, seeing it as a kind of uh, um, uh, fully constructed edifice. It's rather a verb and a process. Um, so I'm very glad to hear that that landed with uh, with someone. So if you if you have access to the sources, I think they've been posted. I will also share my screen now. All right. So one way in which I see this quest-oriented um, vision of Judaism, which I'm going to put forward across the next couple of weeks, as firmly anchored in that, in the ethos of the Hebrew Bible, is this very odd series of paradoxes or tensions, if you will. The first 
is going to come to us from the book of Exodus, then from Psalms, and then a little bit from the Song of Songs. So in the book of Exodus, Moses is famously described as speaking to God face to face. Panim el panim ka'asher yedaber ish el re'ehu. It's there, it's the first source, Exodus 33, 11. Remember that Exodus 33 is sort of like the culmination of these series of responses and calls to God and Moses um, that happen at the revelation at, um, at Sinai. And it's still well within that greater structure, but before the events of Exodus 34 and the destruction of the tablets and then the rebuilding of the tablets, Exodus 33 is sort of sandwiched right in the cleft in the rocks there in the middle between all of that action. And Moses, is described as the one of our tradition who speaks to God panim el panim, face to face, as one speaks to another. Then, given this, Moses says, so, I want to know you. Send, show me your glory. Show me who you are. That's what he says to God. And God famously says, no, I can't. If you look here, verses 22 and 23, that I will put you in the cleft in the rock and shield you. Just note the sakoti. I will make a sukkah of my hand. I know it's a samach, it's a sin and not a samach, but they're the same letter in biblical Hebrew. And it's clear that that is something that is uh, in the imagination of what um, a sukkah is supposed to be, the divine hand shielding us and resting upon us. Next verse, You will, I will take my hand away at just the right moment and you will see my back, but my face cannot be seen. So it's a little bit strange that Moses is described as seeing God face to face. And yet he says to God, but I want to see you. I want to see you in all of your fullness and all of your glory. And God then says, no, nope, sorry, you can't see my face. You can see the back. The Midrash imagines that as God's to fill in. Many other commentators have thought about what does it mean to see the back of God? Maimonides in a beautiful um, in a beautiful passage in the very beginning of the Mishneh Torah, it's not in the Moran uh, Evochim, it's in the Mishneh Torah, um, says that you have to come to know God and love God to such a great extent that God becomes like one of your best friends that when you see them from behind, you know exactly who it is, even without having to see them face to face. But how does that work? If Moses speaks to God face to face, then shouldn't he be able to see God's face? And there seems to be this tension in Exodus 33, in this very repercussive passage within the world of Shemot, in which God can be seen and yet not fully seen. Or perhaps God can be spoken to directly, panim el panim, but there's something that cannot be seen. The face of the divine is something that is either too much, too beyond, something that would be beyond the epistemological framework of the human mind, something that would break the, um, the fundaments of human consciousness, or perhaps simply is too expansive for the mind to take hold of. But the, the story is not so dire. Et achorai, you shall see. Veraita et achorai. There's something that we can grasp a hold of, and there's something that we can know. So hold on to that tension. You can see God's face, you can't see God's face. Recognizing the divine from the behind, as it were, and being able to discern the divinity from even a kind of um, sort of triangulation or situational relationship. If much of the book of Exodus underscores this theme. And it's true in the book of Deuteronomy also. You can't see God. You can't see God. You can't see God. If you see God, it will be too much. One thread of interpretation of the death of Nadav and Avihu, the sons of Aaron who die, um, they kind of die twice in the Hebrew Bible. They die once in the very beginning of the book of Leviticus, and then their death is mentioned again in the middle of 
the book of Leviticus, one thread of interpretation that goes there from the classical Midrash all the way into the world of Hasidut is that they saw too much. They took off the theological sunglasses, as it were, and that's why they died. And if you'll notice that the early account um, in the book of Leviticus has them bringing this strange fire and it talks about their sin, in Leviticus 16, none of that is mentioned. There's nothing about their sin. It's about their, their proximity to the divine. And Judaism is well, in, well, in, um, well aware of the mortal hazards of getting too close to the divine. And part of this dance of this unending journey is the fact that we want to be in relationship with God. And that kind of relationship can only happen if there is some dimension which is not fully consummated. So we've begun to say Psalm 27 twice daily, either in the morning and in the afternoon or in the morning and at night, depending on liturgical customs. But Psalm 27, which is a psalm that carries us all the way from the beginning of Elul, really until the end of the season of the Chagim. Um, it's a psalm that I want to keep reciting all the way to Hanukkah, which according to the Hasidic calendar is the end of the Chagim. But generally we stop towards Simchat Torah. Um, the theme of this psalm is exactly what we've been discussing. The one thing that we ask of God is to come to sit in the house of the divine for all the days of my life, to gaze upon God's beauty, to frequent the vaker, to go often to the divine temple, um, but I want you to hold on to one word, avakesh. One thing do I seek. Hold on to that word. That word is going to be the word that carries us for the next three weeks. Now, in one of the later verses, it says, Echa amar libi, bakshu fanai, et panecha adonai avakesh. In your behalf, my heart says, Seek my face, O oh Lord, I seek your face. Hashem et panecha avakesh. This seems kind of strange, though, because didn't the book of Exodus just say you can never see God's face? Seeing God's face, at least in some parts of the Hebrew Bible, is to step into the divine presence with such fullness and majesty that the human mind can't comprehend it. And yet there's only one thing on King David's mind, standing in the divine presence and seeing the divine face. Uh, Ota Avakesh. That is the thing that I'm looking for. That is the thing that I am on the quest for. That is the thing that I seek. Now, if you look at these passages from the Song of Songs, and while I'm speaking, read them to yourselves. One of the great themes of the Song of Songs is, of course, this love story between the maiden and the beloved, interpreted already in early strata of rabbinic literature as God and the Jewish people. Um, in the medieval times, that takes a different turn. Maimonides, if I'm not mistaken, is the first one in Jewish literature to read it somewhat differently. Rambam reads um, the entirety of the Song of Songs as a love song, not between God and all of the Jewish people, but God and the Jewish soul or the human soul. It's a personalized rereading where each and every one of us find ourselves within the land, landscape and the power of the Song of Songs. But one of the themes of the Song of Songs is that that love is not really ever, you'll forgive me, fleshed out. It doesn't really come to its full expression 
at least in the form of a wedding or something like that that you might imagine. Now, there are references to that, and there is this brief moment at the very end of this first sort of um, uh, pericope or this first section of the book, which is um, the beginning of chapter three. They find each other, and then the book immediately goes on to something else. It's almost as if this, the screen fades to black, and then they are sent back onto the quest once more. But verse two, and you have it here before you, Akuma na vesova ba'ir vashvakim rechavot avaksha et shava nafshi vikashti velomatzativ. That's that's the through line of this book. I get up, I walk around, I look throughout my world, throughout the squares, throughout the uh, marketplaces, throughout the streets. I seek the one I love. I seek the beloved of my soul, and yet I do not find. So what's the point to go on the quest if I don't find? The point is, is that, it, that it's going to be about the quest. And you'll see that the later scholars that we look at build their appreciation of the religious quest, of the religious journey, as something that is transformative, not because of its culmination, but because of the power to spur us forward and to transform us simply because of our commitment to the quest rather than to the answer. I'm just going to hold now for a very brief second. Comments, questions. So that means we had some comments uh, in the chat. If you'd like to read them or I can read them for you, there was also a question. Let well. me see. Um, I, how do I have access to the comments? I don't see them. Would you mind reading them? I'm so sorry. Sure, sure. this goes back a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. So Ruth mentioned a thought face to face, but in the dark, you can feel the other's presence. So not to see visually, but, um, but not see. And then um, Rabbi Judith wrote, I would, I would imagine that it's how the blind see, quote, in, in quote, see a face. They sense it. Mm -hmm. uh, Carly had written a question, live a care, in the first passage. This to me implies something temporary, like a visit. So is this mm -hmm. because you can't live in the closeness? Um, the answer is absolutely. And if you look at the book of Psalms, and if you look at Ecclesiastes also, um, there is, a, it's also in the book of Proverbs, it's really throughout all the wisdom literature as well as the devotional literature. They, there are these very powerful psukim that talk about what happens when you overstay your welcome in God's house. It's a place you go, but it's not a place that you um, put your feet up, shall we say. It's a place that you go and you stand with yurat akavod. You, you go and you go with a sense of, um, of fullness and presence but it is a place that you are in the vaquer. It is someone that you are there to be uh, um, as a visitor and to know that your, your place there is necessarily only temporary and that you will withdraw from that space, transformed from having gone there, but that that is not the place of your residence. Yeah, what a great comment. All of these are fantastic and wonderful comments. Um, good. Was that everything? I believe so, yes. Okay, fantastic. And again, if you have any questions or if you have anything that you would like to say, um, it's an honor and a pleasure to hear that. So I'd like to move now, scooting forward um, about, uh, well, this is somewhat of a contested subject, but certainly at least a millennia, um, to the world of the Tsar. Um, there's probably no book within the history of Judaism that has as rich or full a description of religious quests as the Zohar. And um, one of my teachers, Arthur Green, often says that you can hear the, uh, the flamenca music in the back of the Zohar. It's a, it's a, you know, there's obviously parts of it that go back very far, but it feels like an Iberian text. It feels like an Andalusian text in the sense of, uh, of 13th century Spain. And um, one of the reasons that, that that's the case is um, unlike rabbinic literature, 
in the Zohar, nothing of consequence happens in a Beit Midrash. There are a couple of important moments that happen in caves or a granary, um, but nothing of consequence happens in a physical Beit Midrash. Everything happens when people are on the road, when people are walking around and they'll come to some rock and they'll say, oh my gosh, this rock is here and it needs a chidush, it needs some sort of a devar Torah. Let's start learning. And like, I just thought of this verse that talks about a rock. Oh, there's another verse that talks about a rock. What happens when we get those verses to talk about one another? And the landscape in the Zohar that can, then gets turned into a kind of sacred text and people meet other people along the way. And one of the keys to understanding the Zoharic consciousness is um, it's, it's like the third parak of Ta'anit actually in, uh, in the Talmud. Um, the Talmud has um, in Masach Ta'anit in the tractate that deals with uh, fast days, the third chapter, which is almost entirely, not entirely, but almost entirely legendary material, Agada, um, has something like 22 or 24 characters that you meet basically one after the other. And all of them are somewhat strange. All of the stories are somewhat unsettling. But the point is that you come out of that entire section thinking, wow, it's really not about what I thought. It's really not the people who I would have thought. It's about something entirely different. And the same is true of the Zohar. They meet a donkey driver and the donkey driver transforms their consciousness. They meet a little child or an old man or a maiden or something. And that encounter transforms what's known as the chevraya, or the, um, the friends who are wandering around together. Um, my teacher, Malila Helner Eshed, um, gives a metaphor for um, Zoharic acts of interpretation, um, where the rabbis will get together, again, not in the Beit Midrash, but one of them will put forward um, a theme, one will put forward a, a, uh, a verse, and then everyone else will comment on it as a kind of interpretive jazz session in which the music of exegesis, the music of interpretation of Midrash is born. We'll see a little bit of that in just a moment. Um, so Rabbi Yehuda here, I'll read a little bit of the Aramaic and we'll read a bunch of it in the English also. It's good just to get a sense of the uh, of the of the strangeness of the language even for people who learn a lot of Gemara the Zohar feels familiar and mysterious at the exact same time Rabbi Yehuda Rabbi Yehuda Patach so he begins he opens up as follows um, her husband is known among the gates as he sits among the elders of the land Famous verse, it's in Eshet Chayot, it's in chapter 31 of the book of Mishle, of the book of Proverbs. So that's going to be what the members of the Chabraya are struggling with. Ta Chaze, come and see. Kud Shabrichu, Istalek Biyakare, De Ihu Ganiz Vesatim, De Elia Sagia, Lav Iti Be'ava. Come and see. The Blessed Holy One has ascended in glory. He is hidden. He is concealed. Far above and beyond. There is no one in the world no one since the day that the world was created that can truly understand God's wisdom, that can truly understand him. Um, now, if you understand Proverbs 31 as being about Shekhinah and Tiferet, which are the spherot that are associated with God's male and female personas, which, by the way, is how the Zohar rereads all of the Song of Songs. Um, you might call it an intra-divine romance. Um, if you understand that to be the case, then this verse is very, very strange. Because it seems to suggest that the husband, Ba'ala, can be known. And the Zohar, for four lines here, it's only two lines in the original, says, God can't be known. And not only can God not be known, God really, 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 really can't be unknown, can't be known. And it's, it's ganiz, it's satim, ganuz v'satum in Hebrew. 
God is hidden away. God is concealed. God is, you might say, inscrutable. So how can we know the divine? Now, this is the fasten your seatbelt moment. Um, since he has ascended higher and higher and higher. Um, I'm going to start here in the second paragraph. Di'ihu ganiz v'satim v'istalek le'ela le'ela. Kulu ila'i v'tata'e v'tata'e l'tata'e lo yachli milit dabka. Ad kulu amin baruch kavod adonai mim komo. So since God is so hidden and so concealed and God goes up and up and up, that is to say God is totally transcendent and unknown, all of those above and all of those below, nobody can truly connect to the divine. It's kind of a dour picture, such that they all say, blessed is the glory of God, Mim Komo, from his place, that is, wherever. <laughs> Who knows where it is? No one knows. Tata'e amrai de'ihu le'ela. People down below, they say, God must be above. Dichativ al-shamayin klodo. As it says, God's glory is up behind the heavens. Hilai amrei de'ihu letata. Dichativ al ha'aretz kevodecha. But the angels say, well, God's not here, so God must be down below. As it says, God's uh, glory fills the earth. Ad dikulu ilae vitatae amre baruch kavod adonai mim komo. Such that they all have to say, Blessed is God wherever is God. Because God cannot be known, and there's no one that can know the divine. And then the ending of this paragraph, Veatamant, nod basharim bala. And yet you say God can be known in the gates. This is a fascinating theological image. To say that human beings don't understand God is no great chidush. To say that the angels don't understand God, also, there are certain texts that point in that direction. There are certain texts that point in the direction of saying the angels really understand things. But what's so fascinating about this is that it, it, um, it describes the confusion that we say that we have in terms of divine, uh, the divine, whether it's theology or divine placement, or is God transcendent or imminent or whatever, but we're all confused. The angels think God must be somewhere else. We think God must be somewhere else. And then we finally connect with one another and realize you haven't seen him. I haven't seen him. No one knows where God is. Well, it must be somewhere else. Uh, until everyone takes up the courage to say, well, blessed is the divine wherever that may be. Now, watch as the text has been going in a particular direction. Unknowable, unknowable, unknowable. You'll never know. And then it's going to tilt entirely on its side. If, if the rationalist philosophers, you'll see Maimonides is one of a great example of this, take away all the things that we use to describe God. The Bible says that God is a hand. No, no, it's not really a hand. The Bible says that God is a voice. No, no, he doesn't really talk. No, no, you can't really know this. You can't really know that. The Zohar is going to acknowledge all of those things about our inability to comprehend the divine in its fullness and yet turn the question on its side by painting this vast array of amazing images and saying, don't take any of them too seriously, but don't give up on the power of relationship with the divine and don't give up on the power of imagery and the power of the imagination. Ella vadai no da basharim ba'ala. Surely God can be known. Da kuchabrihu. This is the Blessed Holy One, which in the lexicon of the, of the Sfirot is associated with Tiferet, not really essential for understanding what I think is the basic thrust of this text. The ihu idyada vi tabak vifum ma de mishaer belibe. So God can be known, and one can become connected to the divine to the extent that one, and here's the critical word, 
Sha'ar in rabbinic Hebrew is a gate, just as it is in biblical Hebrew. The gate, of course, is the most important part of the city. That's the place where all the important people sit and stand and talk. Um, so that's the place that you'd want to be known. It's like being known in the town square or the, uh, the plaza in, in other geographic constructions. Um, but Lisha'er has another meaning. Um, it can also mean a price, but that's uh, not important for us. Lisha'er can mean to estimate or to imagine. So ma de misha'er belibe. Um, Daniel Matt, in the translation that you have before you in characteristic brilliance, ca characterizes it um, in both ways. Um, you step into the gateway of the imagination. Misha'er belibe. To the extent that you are willing to step into the gateway of the imagination, that's the way that you come to know God. That's the way that you can come to understand the divine even with the knowledge that that will be, okay, it's a personal theology and not an ontological theology. It's something built out of my experience as opposed to knowing exactly what the structure of all the universe is, but it's about my relationship with the divine and the way in which I have cracked open the heart mind to be open to that relationship. Knowledge doesn't have to be sure-footed in the sense of, um, of log logical propositions and dispositive answers in order to be religiously meaningful. One of my other teachers, Rabbi Zalman Shachter Shalomi, um, who I'll talk about again at the very end, um, gave, a, gave a, um, an example, a parable for emunah, which has always stuck with me. Um, when once asked, what is emunah? Um, he said, what's faith? Faith is like throwing a grappling hook over a wall and feeling it stick on something. And you tug on the rope and you can feel that it's strong. And you begin to climb and you can feel that it works, but you have absolutely no idea what it's holding on to. And faith is climbing anyway. In a different sense, but not entirely different, when you open up the gates of the imagination, that is how you come to see the divine. That's a different understanding than if you work through every possible proposition and come to a kind of certain knowledge. It's also different than if I undertake a mystic quest and I ascend through all the heavenly palaces and then at the very end of it, I see God in all of God's glory, in all of God's perfection, in all of God's um, fullness. At the end of the day, this text would say, you are never going to see God's face. But the achorai, the, um, the behind, as it were, that the afterglow of divinity is found in the human imagination. Um, I see the icon for questions is popping up. Now I can't find it again. Um, Yudas, would you mind, are there any questions? Sure, there was one question from Facebook yeah. actually. I posted it okay. in the chat. It says, from Gabriel, on, um, he asks, this sounds a lot like Hasidism. What's the difference between the Kabbalah of the Zohar and Hasidism? Okay. Um, amazing, amazing question. Um, here's how I'll say it. The Zohar is, um, is really the crowning jewel of medieval Kabbalah. Um, again, with ancient roots, it is an extraordinary work, um, such that a Hasidic master in the 18th century said, Baruch Hashem, that I was created in the 18th century after the Zohar, because that's what kept me Jewish. That, I mean, that's literally what he says. And the, because in the 18th century, there was actually other possibilities to move into other different kinds of communities. Um, but I think what he really means is like, this is the language of my heart. And there's a, there's a thread of continuity that goes between the Zohar and, and Hasidut that is a very, very important one. And there's not any sermon within the world of Hasidut that probably doesn't either refer to implicitly or explicitly something in the Zohar. 
That being said, the Zohar is very much a work of medieval Kabbalah in the sense that it is interested in the, um, in the matrices of heaven. It's interested in the Sfirot, these emanated powers. Um, there are 10 of them in most Kabbalistic works. Sometimes there's more, sometimes there's less, but eventually that gets ironed out and it's 10, not nine, not 11. And you have to believe in just 10, otherwise you're a total heretic. But if you don't believe in 10, then you don't really know anything. And they walk on this very, very fine line. Um, the way that Hasidu will take that is that it um, inherits that vast system of associations, of the Sfirot, of this kind of imaginative language. And you might say a kind of ethos. Um, in some ways, it's a deeply erotic impulse of this kind of love-saturated Judaism, um, love of other people, love of the divine, which is why, again, if you open up the Zohar, um, it, it, um, there's always an interesting exercise that I have with my students when I'm teaching Gemara. Um, how long in any rabbinic discussion does it take to get back to the Mikdash, to the temple? Usually it's not very long. Um, and that has to do with the sort of in inherence of the temple within the early rabbinic imagination, that even things that are vastly disparate from the temple or have nothing to do with it explicitly, um, within two or three lines, you're going to get back to the discussion of the temple. The Zohar, for that, um, is going to be the Song of Songs. No matter what you're talking about, the Song of Songs is going to come up. Um, it is a work that just um, shimmers with intertextual references to the Song of Songs for the obvious reason that if you are trying to build a um, quest-oriented, love-soaked Jewish ethos, the Song of Songs is going to be the language from which you construct that. So the, the, the ethos that I've just been describing gets taken into Hasidut, but it is turned away from what goes on in heaven and is trained more toward what goes on in the human heart. Now, what I've given you today is actually kind of a bad example for that because it feels so deeply Hasidic. And that question is so perfect because we, I mean, this is a, a text that's often quoted in Hasidic works for exactly that reason. Um, but you'll see in the next paragraph, and we're not going to read this all together, um, Rabbi Shimon, who Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is the star of the Zohar, um, he sort of like puts a halt on that and says, no, no, no. Yeah, we can know God. Um, but you know God through the Sfirot. We have these things called the Shi'arim, the gateways, and those are the Sfirot, and that's how you come to know God, which is to say, through this kind of crystallized body of knowledge, the Sfirot that Shimon Bar Yochai is giving to his disciples, that's how you come to know God. But what I love about Rabbi Yehuda is that there is this kind, in this passage, is that there's almost a kind of deeply personal, almost anarchic, dimension to his theology. How do you know God? Throw open the gates of the human heart. And Rabbi Shimon said, no, we have this thing called systematic theology, and I'm going to give it to you in my own Zoharic form. The, the Hasidic masters are going to fall much more in the category of the first rather than the second. And more importantly, they are interested in the way in which Kabbalah can be used to describe the intricate network of the human heart, as opposed to the intricate network of divine powers. So you might think of it as Kabbalah turned inward. Right? Buber famously put it that Mar Martin Buber, um, the 20th century Jewish theologian um, and philosopher, um, described Hasidism as Kabbalah turned ethos um, toward a kind of lived experience, but one with deeply ethical constructions as well. And he's not wrong about that. Um, it's the, the way in which um, the, the um, I guess the fancy word for this would be the theosophical structures or the, um, the ways in which we engender knowledge of God um, are used within, within Hasidut to transform our knowledge of the self and of other people with the knowledge, as Elie Wiesel once put it, that Hasidism understands that the road to God leads through the human heart. Good, I saw one other raised hand. Daniel, I believe you had your hand raised. Yes. Hi, Rav Nate. Nice How are to you? see you. Good to see you. Yeah, you too. Um, so what I was kind of hearing throughout this entire presentation is kind of almost an embrace in the uncertainty, right? That it's 
it's the quest that is that is what is important in this existential search for kind of what is faith, um, what is kind of teshuva, kind of you know things of that nature. And and I'm curious um, when there is, when there is kind of in a paradigm changing event, um, kind of in the context of kind of chasidut, right? If there is a paradigm changing event such as the establishment of the state of Israel, um, right? How would something like that kind of when this faith in God then becomes kind of faith in a nation state or faith in kind of a messianic process, right? How does that then kind of change this whole kind of world of faith in this kind of quest that you're describing in your uh, work? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, yeah, scholars of American law often, or this is a contested concept, but some of them refer to something called a constitutional moment, um, which is a, an event or a series of events that is either so unprecedented or so far beyond the, the normal purview that it forces you to read everything in the common law tradition back to the constitution um, totally differently. And the advent of the state of Israel is one of these, feminism is another, it's a, um, it's a paradigm shift. Um, so Hasidism in its modern forms, and by that I don't mean 18th century, which is in some senses also modern, but let's say contemporary forms in the 20th century and certainly in the 19th century to a certain degree also, has embraced a kind of sociological model, which is quite, um, um, quite calcified by the 19th century. Um, some might say ossified, others might say um, um, very stable. There are nice ways of putting it also, but in the embrace of dynastic structures, in the embrace of traditionalism as an ideology, as opposed to a kind of orientation, um, which is more open, Hasidism chooses to close more doors than it opens. And the relationship to the state of Israel in Hasidic communities is obviously very fraught. How ever. Um, if you look at works of 20th century Jewish, uh, sorry, Hasidic thought and philosophy, um, all of these themes continue to echo and continue to be deeply, deeply felt, but they're felt primarily on a personal dimension. One of the things that I feel, having spent a lot of time studying this literature and made conscious and unconscious decisions not to join Hasidic communities, but rather to think about what does this language give to me as a modern person and as a modern seeker, as someone who seeks to live in a different kind of world than contemporary Hasidism is, what is the lesson to be learned from this that I can apply to my own world and perhaps bring the lessons to that, of, to that world? And that is a firm embrace of, of indeed, Danny, just as you said, um, of a kind of theological uncertainty, of a kind of political uncertainty, of a kind of certainly messianic uncertainty, in the sense that when you began to play the cards of absolute certainty, and in doing so, you jettison nuance, and you jettison doubt, and you jettison reflectiveness, then you are building a castle out of cards on the San Andreas Fault without realizing or taking responsibility for the fact that you are doing so. And so one of the things that I come to Hasidut for is the fact that it gives me a language for thinking that through and then also saying that action is also needed. And you'll see this in the last text that we're gonna look at. Um, this next text, we're not gonna read together. I wanna give it to you because it's just one of my favorites. It's a 16th century rabbi. Um, um, who knows a little bit about modern science and knows that there are, um, there are gravitational orbits. And um, he, he's commenting on our passage in the Zohar, and he says that um, Rabbi Yehuda is of the belief, as opposed to Rabbi Shimon, who says, you have this body of knowledge and you can understand everything. Um, in that way, he's kind of a Maimonidean figure, like you really can understand things to the extent that you that you, that you are able as a human being. Um, Maimonides is a famous passage in the beginning of the second part of the guide where he says, now that we have proved the existence of God, we can go on to other things, which always strikes us as moderns as a very funny formulation. Rabbi Shimon Levi in his Ketem Paz here, the 16th century commentator, um, sees Rabbi Yehuda as the one who talks about the power of the quest, not as a kind of foolishness, 
but as a sense, as a, an embrace of the sense that um, despite the quote unquote seeming failure, um, because you haven't attained the goal, the quest itself is the real desire. And he here has this fabulous formulation that's there in the first par paragraph, kol amishtokek lo yanuach milavakesh. Anyone who knows the power of yearning, of love, of desire. And the word ishtokek um, has within it those valences of chuka, of yearning. In Arabic, um, the word ishk is this kind of burning passion felt for other people or for God. Lishtokek is exactly that. If you have that, truly, lo yanuach min levakesh. You won't give up. Remember that word? Bakasha, the quest. You will stay on the quest, even though, and then he quotes our verses from the Song of Songs, et shava nafshi bikashtiv velo matzataiv. I look and I haven't found. Um, and then Rabbi Shimon Levi, you'll see, um, then says, this is why the um, heavenly arrays, by which he means the planets and the stars, um, move in circles. Um, orbits, and um, um, I don't remember what it's called, but when planets rotate on their axis, it's not an orbit. Um, I used to know. Whatever, it's been now about 20 years since I took physics, so you gotta cut me some slack. Um, Things in the heavens move in circles. Why? Because they're always on the hunt. They're always looking for something, right? There's a kind of, um, um, it's baked into the cake of the cosmos that things are always looking for God. And yet it's circular in the sense that no one's ever gonna find it. No one's ever gonna arrive there. A planet never stops moving. And a religious seeker, kola mishtokek lo yanuach milavakesh even though the planet never arrives at its place of ultimate repose, even though a religious seeker never arrives at the place of, I figured it all out, I do all the mitzvot right, or even I do this one mitzvah right, it's not gonna ever happen. But again, you don't give up the quest. So rather than read this to you, I'm gonna tell you an oral version of it and you can check it against the text from the Baal Shem Tov here, I'm gonna shrink it, and you have it, um, but I wanna get both parts on the same page. And again, if you can't read it, you'll read it later. I want you to hear it orally. The Baal Shem Tov says, um, he quotes it not directly from Socrates, but he's quoting Socrates, the ultimate goal of all knowledge is not to know. And then he says, but there are two kinds of not knowing. There's the kind of not knowing of the person who shows up at the king's house and sees that the door says, the king is not home and goes home. And then there's the other kind of person that opens the door, sees that it's unlocked, walks around, goes into the armory, goes into the mess hall, walks all throughout the king's palace and doesn't see the king and then goes home. And the Baal Shem Tov says those are two different kinds of not knowing and don't conflate them. The first one is out of ignorance. The second, however, is someone who has undertaken a quest and has been changed by that quest and has been transformed by that quest and doesn't know. When people ask me if I know my kids, I will hem and I will haw and I will say, oh, give out. And at the end of the day, I will say, no, I really don't. They are endlessly surprising. That is true of all human beings. And it is certainly true of God. And so the Baal Shem Tov has told us something very powerful. In his formulation of the same rule, kol mishtokek lo yanuach milavakesh. Just because you won't have a theophany, a kind of revelation when you get to the end of the quest, akin, akin to Sinai. And maybe it, it's nothing more than a still small voice. Or maybe it's silence. Or maybe it's like feeling a face in the dark. Or maybe it is just 
the power of sitting together with God in the dark without even feeling anything and just knowing that there is somebody else there, something else there, even though you cannot see and even though you cannot know, you sit together in silence. That is something not only not to be taken for granted, but that itself, and not to be overshadowed by looking for some sort of imagined goal, but that itself is, in some sense, the most kind of transformative experience for which we can yearn. It's a commitment to the process of bakasha, of quest, of being in process, theologically, religiously, emotionally, and intellectually, rather than yearning for certitude or completion. Okay, I'm gonna pause here. I know that our time is up. I'm happy to sit for a few more minutes. Anyone who wants to continue talking, I'm happy to sit. Um, otherwise, we'll talk a little bit about these themes next week, and then we'll go on to another rich panoply of texts. Um, if anyone wants to continue thinking about this, compare the passage from the Baal Shem Tov to that of Maimonides, um, which you have in the middle here, his famous, passage, his famous parable about the uh, um, seeking for God as looking, um, looking throughout the divine um, uh, palace. And you'll see that there are a couple of very critical and interesting differences. Um, but that, as they say, is me all the may ever. It's extra credit. Thank you so much, uh, Rabbi Nays. I really appreciate it. One comment was actually from Mara. She, you said that you were having trouble remembering what it was from physics. So she said that's from Aristotle. It's the rotation of the planets. So I'm not sure if that's what you were referring to, but that was uh, one guess that might have been. That's um, the information I needed to know. Thank you so <laughs> much, Mara. Excellent. And uh, so thank you again for, for this really in interesting and inspiring lecture. And uh, thank you all to everyone um, who are joining us today from Zoom and from Drisha Live and from Facebook. Uh, this afternoon, we're gonna continue our Elul journey with the start of a five-part series about the Kapara of Yom Kippur with Rabbi Dr. Shlomo Zukir. In tonight's session, Rabbi Zukir will undertake a close analysis of relevant Sukkim in the first chapter of Parshat Achremot that discuss the significance of the day of Yom Kippur for those achieving atonement. If you haven't yet registered, there's still time. For more information, visit our site www.drisha.org forward slash classes. The Zoom and the Facebook Live link and the Drisha Live link, they're all posted in each class. You can also join over the phone as well as some of you have done this afternoon. Uh, thank you again, Rabbi Dr. Mays. We're happy to have had this opportunity to learn with you. We look forward to seeing you and um, everyone else in cyberspace next, next week's session. Same time, same place, and hopefully sooner in our other upcoming classes at Drisha. Have a wonderful rest of your day, everyone. Take care. Thank you very much.